أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I hope everyone is doing well, inshallah, and I'm, I'm so excited to see all of your faces. Uh, it's, so, it's so refreshing to see you know, a topic like this uh, being talked about in a masjid. It really is something that uh, myself and fellow mental health professionals, uh, we talk about, you know, that it really needs to be discussed in Muslim spaces. It needs to be discussed in masajid. We need to create those spaces in which people can come to the masjid, you know, and learn about these social issues that we're all facing, right? Because we know that religion isn't separate from, you know, religious health, spiritual health is not separate from our mental health, right? It's all intertwined and it's all connected. And that's why it's so important to, to have these conversations in these spaces. So I wanted to thank uh, you know, the organizers and ICLI and everyone involved to hold such an event and to thank each and every one of you for being here, being present and being a part of this conversation. And so I usually don't do the presentations because I like to really connect with everybody in the audience. And I find that if I'm looking at you and having a conversation with you, I can really connect in that way. I want each of you to kind of look inward, you know, as I talk for uh, this little bit of time, looking inward and focusing on yourself. You know, for whatever reason you came in, maybe you know somebody struggling with a mental health challenge or, you know, a drug addiction or whatever, you know, the reason that you, you came in for, just to really look inward. Um, and I, I'm so sad that I missed the talk before because I know it focused a lot on, you know, the things that we can do to, to, to feel better because that's really that first topic is the, the mental illness versus mental wellness. And I think as a community, we need to focus more on the mental wellness because each and every one of us, we have mental health, right? And each and every one of us can get involved in preventative factors. We can get... Uh, you know, involve each other and participate in prevention, right? If you can predict it, you can prevent it, right? Be proactive instead of reactive. So all of these kinds of statements, how are we being proactive when it comes to mental health? And I come from, you know, a trauma background. So really just intertwining some of the, the topics that were mentioned as far as like mental health and versus mental illness, but also trauma because it's all intertwined. I invite all of you to study a bit more into the ACE research, right? The ACE study, this ACE. So it was a study, a longitudinal study. I don't have the exact facts in front of me, but a longitudinal study over a series of years on adverse childhood experiences. That's what ACE stands for. And adverse childhood experiences, uh, there's a list of them. So you know, being like physical abuse, you know, and all these are trigger warnings, physical abuse and neglect, you know, sexual abuse and neglect, um, a parent who's been incarcerated, uh, domestic violence in the home, uh, mental health challenge. Uh, as you notice, I don't always call it mental illness. Uh, with my viewpoint, I kind of, I don't see it necessarily as an illness, but it's a mental health challenge that so many of us face. So a mental health challenge in the home right, for, with a parent. And these are just some of the examples of possible adverse childhood experiences that someone has experienced. And you get a score, right, zero to five, and the higher your score is, which means that the, the more you experience an adverse childhood experience, the more likely you are to. And there's a long list, but one of them being health, physical health challenges, um, the more likely you are to abuse drugs, the more likely you are to be incarcerated, the more likely you are to experience all kinds of physical ailments and even early death. And so what, it, what this study is doing is teaching us kind of what caused it all, right? What leads to it all. I think a lot of times when we're talking about mental illness and we're talking about drug abuse, 
we're focusing on the problem and, and rightly so because it's a crisis situation and we need to get the help. We need to deal with that crisis right away. So I'm not talking about the crisis portion, right? We're going to have some other psychiatrists and, and drug specialists who are talking about the crisis portion. I'm talking about where did it all stem from? And can we as a community focus on the source? And my lens is a trauma lens. So I will tell you a lot of this is, yes, uh, what I've studied. Also my experience with 10 plus years of working in the community with individuals, couples, and, and families, majority of them being Muslim. So it comes from all of that. It comes from my recent training of being trained in EMDR, which is also something I invite everyone to look into is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a holistic and absolutely amazing gift from Allah to heal trauma at the source. And I'm so passionate about EMDR because it works. It's literally Allah's miracle because they don't even, they don't even, they can't even explain it yet how EMDR works. You basically use eye movement kind of like in REM sleep, right? Like our eyes, our eyes dart back and forth. And it was, it, was, it was created by a researcher, so not even a therapist. So it's all research-based, evidence-based treatment. So it's not just like, woo like something that somebody came up with. Some of my clients are like, are you like hypnotizing me? No, it's all research-based, evidence-based treatment. And you basically use eye movement to access traumatic memories so we go back to visit a traumatic memory in which a negative belief of self was developed. We go back to the original memory, desensitize. So that's the EM, eye movement, desensitization. We desensitize. So all of those uh, symptoms that lead to drug abuse, right, or the symptoms that lead to mental uh, illness, the anxiousness, the PTSD symptoms, the trauma symptoms, the flashbacks, the nightmares and you know that just this agitation that's in the body right because we we aren't a community and i know i'm jumping from a lot of things so i hope you're all following me because <laughs> i got a lot on my mind when it comes to this we have an agitation in our bodies we don't talk about the mindfulness and the you know the meditation enough right so desensitization what we're doing is we're desensitizing the effects of revisiting the trauma. So if I think back to a trauma memory, and I've got so many, I've been in therapy over 10 years myself. So if I revisit a trauma memory, what happens in my body? What happens in you know, my mind? Do I start to get agitated or frustrated or do I kind of re-experience the trauma? And a lot of times we do, we re-experience the trauma because the body keeps the score. That's another book I invite all of you to read. The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. So our body keeps the score, our body remembers. So, so the trauma event may have occurred 20 years ago, but when I re remember it, it's as if I'm re-experiencing it in the moment because the body remembers, the mind remembers, the soul remembers everything. And I will re-experience that event in the moment. So what EMDR does is desensitizing. It brings down those symptoms. And we don't, we don't stop there. What we do also is then reprocess. So if I had a traumatic memory, and I'll, I'll tell you my personal trauma story, I was left in the van at three years old in the middle of the night. And as a parent myself, I can understand, you know, my daughter actually was left in an elevator. So it's not about blaming parents because we do our best, we try our best, we fail, we mess up miserably. You know, I've got four kids myself, I mess up with all of them. But it's acknowledging the traumatic experience. And that's why I also want to, uh, everyone to understand the word trauma because a lot of times when I use that word, we think of those adverse childhood experiences that I went back to in the beginning. So we think of those really big traumas. But trauma is the experience of the person. It's the perception of the person in the moment. You know, my daughter being left in the elevator for like five seconds, right? And the doors opened. And then I grabbed her and I hugged her and I said, I'm so sorry, are you okay? Somebody might not classify that as a traumatic event. But guess what? It was traumatic. You know, she experienced anxiousness, nightmares, 
mommy, are you going to leave me questions? So it was a traumatic event. That's why I also want us to understand the word trauma. If we are human, then we have experienced trauma. Varying degrees, varying levels, right? So going back to EMDR, what we do is we revisit that traumatic memory. I gave mine, right, being left in the van. And in that moment, for me, the negative belief was that was, that was instilled in that moment and not to my parents' fault was there's something wrong with me. Because I have seven siblings and none of them were left in the van. I was. And so a child will internalize that negative belief. And parents have no idea. Like that negative belief was instilled inside of me for the rest of my life that I would think there's something wrong with me. And so you go back to that traumatic memory, desensitize, that I'm able to talk about it now. Before, a couple of years ago, if you mentioned that memory, I'd be a mess. You know, I'd be crying. I would have like severe anxiety, and I would not even be able to talk about it. Alhamdulillah, therapy, EMDR has helped me to be able to desensitize, like we talked about, and mention it. And then the next part is reprocessing. So now what we do is we basically extract, because I always like kind of visualize it, extract that negative belief of there's something wrong with me and replace it with there's nothing wrong with me. I'm special, I'm important, and I'm loved. And so now what does that do for the rest of your life? That when you go back to that core memory in which that negative belief about yourself was rooted, and now you unroot it and replace it with that positive belief. Imagine the impact. And so that's why when we talk about mental health challenges, what I like to believe is there's nothing wrong with you. Something wrong happened to you. And so it's much more empowering. I focus on strengths, and I think as a community, we really need to. We, yes, we need to understand the problems. Yes, we need to have a conversation about what are the risks, what are the issues, how do we have to know what's going on in the community and the problems. But I think sometimes we focus too much on the problems, and we don't necessarily focus on the empowering view of it, especially when it comes to our youth. I work with a lot of teens. I work with a lot of teens and I, I help a lot of parents understand that all they need is love. And that doesn't mean you don't give that discipline or you don't give that um, guidance, right? But it's guidance with love the way the Prophet ﷺ did it, right? And so when we look at mental health challenges, I want us to transform from only people who have a diagnosis need therapy because we all need therapy. If you're human, you need therapy and you can benefit tremendously from it because we all have, you know, we don't know ourselves best, right? We know Allah knows us best, but you can sit with a professional to help you understand why maybe you do the things that you do. You know, why is your team not listening to you? Why is, you know, your relationship suffering? Why is all of this going on? And you can get those perspectives and really sit and get that healing. And if you can see an EMDR therapist, EMDR therapy is three times as effective as talk therapy alone, right? Any kind of trauma therapy that involves the body, that involves the, the limbic system of the brain, it's gonna be faster and more powerful than just talk therapy alone. So I'll end with this is let's transform our view of, of mental illness as there's something wrong with the person because it's not, you know, they have a challenge, just like we're all given different challenges and it's, nothing's wrong with them, something wrong happened to them. And let's view people who have a mental health challenge and who have a drug addiction with compassion and with love and with understanding. So we invite them to healing because that is a barrier to help. That is a barrier to healing, is the stigma and is the judgment that they'll face from the community. So let's see everyone and ourselves with that lens of compassion, right? With that, that deep core of compassion and let's create safety, safe spaces for ourselves and for others. And just ending off with 
that healing will occur in safe spaces and in safe bodies. So we've got to get our bodies to feel safe as well. So even as I'm talking, I'm really excited. I'm really passionate about this stuff because I've been in EMDR therapy 10 plus years. And then I've been using it with all of my clients as well. I, I have to pay attention to self. And just like I asked you in the very beginning to pay attention to yourselves, your heart rate, your anxiousness level, what is going on, the energy in your body and bringing that down. And so I'd love to leave everyone with a skill that you can take home. This is bilateral stimulation, connects all sides of the brain. And it's a, it's a very easy way to kind of calm your energy. Basically, left and right, you can do tapping. So I like to do the butterfly hug. You know, I do it with my daughter. You can do it with your kids. You can just tap on your legs right now. But it's basically just slow left and right tapping. And you can connect it with your breathing, right? Breathe in and exhale with an S sound. Again. Let's just do it one more time. So I hope you feel a little bit more of that energy kind of calmed a bit. Exhaling with the S sound really shakes up your nervous system. And then the tapping connects all sides of your brain. So inshallah, I hope that was helpful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be more loving and more compassionate and create more safety for ourselves and everyone around us, especially our children. They need that safety in order to come to us when they are suffering and they're suffering. So may Allah help us to do that. Subhanaka wa bihamdik nashadu wa na ilaha illa anta nasakbirika wa natubu ilayk. Subhanarabika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillah.